So I've been struggling all week with how to start this sermon. I originally thought I'd like to start with a uh, sensationalist, provocative statement designed to rattle everyone in their seats right from the jump. Uh, so the provocative statement I originally came up with was this. In order for Unitarian Universalism to fulfill its promise and potential as a 21st century postmodern faith, we must abandon the fourth principle. Pretty provocative, right? But if I'm being honest, and I am a minister, so I probably should be, uh, that's not exactly what I'm arguing for this morning. Uh, yes, I do have some problems with the current articulation of our fourth principle, and this sermon will touch on some of those problems, but I'm not really arguing that we should abandon the principle, so don't worry, no heresy this morning. Oh, <laughs> Forgot you're all heretics. So then, so then I thought... Well, maybe the provocative nature of this sermon is that it just might contain a peculiar amalgam of philosophical and theological ideas that, taken together, could actually serve to explain the mechanics of the nebulous, largely unarticulated, possibly mythic, underlying conviction that unites all you use, whether atheist, agnostic, or theist, and create a tenable middle ground between the feuding, spiraling streams of mysticism and humanism that make up the double helix of our theological DNA. <laughs> but this sermon doesn't do that either. I mean, that would be asking a lot for a 20-minute sermon, you know? Uh, so then around Friday, uh, I just kind of accepted the fact that this sermon isn't nearly as provocative as I thought it would be. It contains few original thoughts. It's mostly just a curated parade of quotes from old dead white guys. <laughs> Trust me, no one is more disappointed by that fact than me. We, we could try to make them girls. I mean, we'll quote from, you know, Susan Nietzsche, and <laughs> Betty Kierkegaard today. <sighs> if we just could hack time and go backwards and get women, all right, never mind. So this morning, sadly, you will hear nothing too provocative, just some musings that lately have been clunking around inside my head like a phone book in a dryer. <laughs> Most of us here today are likely already familiar with that most famous maxim of Friedrich Nietzsche, God is dead. Nietzsche first wrote these words in a work published back in 1882, a work called The Gay Science. Now it's a powerful idea, one that is often misunderstood as most powerful ideas are. Nietzsche is not talking about a literal death of a literal God. He's simply noting, observing really, that in a modern age of science and philosophy and higher criticism, the traditional Judeo-Christian concept of God can no longer serve as humanity's source for morality, meaning, or ultimate value. That idea right there, actually it didn't originate with Nietzsche. Nietzsche had several philosophical forerunners. Nietzsche just coined the succinct, viscerally reactive, incredibly marketable hashtag that has come to attach itself to that idea. The idea itself, that there is no objective authoritative meaning to anything in the universe, forms the foundation of all existentialist philosophy. It is an idea that has induced angst, anger, even terror in the minds and hearts of many. And as such, it has inspired some passionate responses from those who refuse to believe life lacks a singular, objective meaning. Historically speaking, the primary philosophical rebuttal to the Nietzschean charge that God is dead has been, nuh uh. <laughs> uh That's a paraphrase. <laughs> to be fair, the most compelling version of the nuh -uh argument belongs to Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Very basically, Kierkegaard argues thusly, granted, faith in any kind of God or transcendent reality that might be able to provide an objective, authoritative meaning to life, the universe, and everything. Such a faith is completely irrational. 
Nevertheless, the religious life, the highest form of living that any human can express, requires just such an irrational, absurd leap of faith, because life is more than merely the objectively rational. It's the beginning, and just the beginning, of a fascinating philosophical and theological dialogue that can be reduced to this question. Should one, like Nietzsche or Albert Camus, accept and embrace the idea packed within the words, God is dead? Or should one, like Kierkegaard, take a leap of faith and hold out at least some hope there is a divine framework out there somewhere that makes sense of all of this. The problem, or perhaps the beauty of this question, is that it cannot be definitively answered, which is great for a faith like Unitarian Universalism, a faith that loves to play with untestable hypotheses and celebrates diversity of thought. Because this dialogue hinges on essentially an unanswerable question, every conversation can amicably end like this. I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. <laughs> now where shall we go to lunch? <laughs> but I'm here this morning to tell you that I don't think it's quite that easy. See, I think there actually might be a definitive answer to the underlying question that reason will compel us, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, to accept. Spoiler alert. I'm going to tell you right now in the middle of this sermon what the answer is, so plug your ears if you don't want to hear. Right. My own conclusion is this. The Nietzschean position must win. Kierkegaard's leap of faith proposition is not simply less compelling, it is completely untenable. Now this does not mean, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying, I'm not suggesting this means that there is no God, or that faith in God is silly or irrational. It just means that the question of the existence of God isn't germane to this particular discussion. I would suggest conclusively there is no objective, ultimate authority meaning to anything, and there is nothing that any God can do to change that fact. Now to make this case, I'm going to temporarily abandon Nietzsche, and I'm going to tag in Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes was a 20th century French literary critic and linguist. Barthes is most famous for an idea and an associated catchphrase that frankly is far more subversive and revolutionary than Nietzsche's idea that God is dead. Extrapolated to its fullest expression, Barthes' idea comes to the same inexorable conclusion as Nietzsche and also renders useless Kierkegaard's leap of faith argument at the same time. Succinctly stated, Barthes' idea is this, the author is dead. I'll say that one more time for those that may have never heard this before. The author is dead. Barth somewhat explains this idea in a short essay published in 1967. Among the arguments Barth makes in this essay is this. All text is open to multiple interpretations. There is no single meaning to any text. The so-called author's interpretation of his or her own work is but one of many ways to understand the text, and though perhaps informative, the author's intent is in no way authoritative. Now, if you've never noticed it before, you should take note of it now. The words author, authority, and authoritative, they're all the same word. That is, they have the same root, so an author allegedly is someone who has authority over the meaning of a particular text, presumably a text that he or she wrote himself or herself. Now the upshot of all this is, in Barth's own words, the death of the author is the birth of the reader. Because truly, when you think about it, it is the reader who creates meaning from all texts, not the author, who really, in Barth's estimation, is nothing more than a writer, one who scribbles words without authority to tell you what those scribbles mean. Once text is written, Barth's argues, it no longer belongs to the author, 
The text has become a thing unto itself, accessible to anyone who wishes to read it and open to interpretation. If this is the first time you've heard this argument and you're a bit skeptical, let me give you an example that might demonstrate what Barthes is getting at. Let's say you enter into a contract with another party. We'll call this other party Bob. So Bob writes up a contract for the sale and purchase of a widget, and you both sign this contract. Now, according to the terms of the written contract, you will purchase from Bob one widget in exchange for $5. You and Bob execute the contract. You give Bob $5. He gives you his widget. The next day, Bob calls you up and says, uh, hey, when do you uh, plan to pay me that additional $5 you owe me for that widget? You're confused. You express your confusion to Bob. You reiterate that the contract you both signed, it clearly stated that the widget cost only $5, which you have already paid. Bob responds by saying, oh yeah, I know. But when I wrote that contract, I actually meant in my head $10. So that numeral five on the contract, it actually means 10, because that was my intent as the author. So you owe me $5. You might think this is a ridiculous example, but there is a reason we have 1.25 million lawyers in this country. <laughs> the point is, Barthes would argue, no writer has the tyrannical, dictatorial authority to unilaterally declare how their work must be interpreted. The creator of that text is simply a writer, a scribbler, maybe a curator, but not an author. What makes Barth's idea so subversive is that the principle generalizes. It can, perhaps must, be extrapolated to its ultimate philosophical and theological conclusion. Because you see, as Thomas was suggesting this morning with our kids, absolutely everything is text. Absolutely everything is text. Jacques Derrida, the famous 20th century French philosopher and linguist, the father of deconstructionism, once stated, there is nothing outside the text. All observable phenomenon in this universe is text. All of creation speaks. All of creation can be and is interpreted. And every one of us is reading that text, constantly creating meaning from the endless streams of stimuli that relentlessly bombard our senses. Simply by opening your eyes this morning, even before your mind could form a single coherent thought, you were reading the text of reality, your mind creating myriad narratives, explanations, defining relationships in space and time. And from there, of course, the mind can go on to even higher order thinking, finding patterns, seeing cause and effect relationships, looking for order, maybe even where order does not exist. The mind creates rules, it creates laws, hence the birth of reason, morality, aesthetics, meaning, all acts of interpretation, all acts of reading text. We human beings all engage the world as readers. The human experience, our interface with all reality, is a textual experience. And like all encounters with complex text, this so-called simple act of living in this world, it requires energy, activity, creativity, abstract thinking, and a willingness to accept ambiguity. So to briefly recap, where we are right now. If we accept the premise that everything is text, and if we accept Barth's assertion that the author is dead, meaning there is no single authoritative interpretation of text, then reason dictates we must accept the existentialist conclusion that there is no objective, intrinsic, or authoritative meaning to any of this. The Kierkegaardian leap of faith loophole has been closed by Barth's. Though Kierkegaard argues, hey, there might be a God out there somewhere to make sense of all this. Barth replies, perhaps so, but it doesn't matter. Even if there is a white-bearded Judeo-Christian God above sitting on a cloud, such a God still is not the author of creation. At best, he can only be the writer of creation. Like all writers, 
he does not possess the authority to tell us what all this really means. That power is reserved to each one of us through the act of reading. So, if we have in fact determined that there is no possible objective authoritative meaning to life, the universe, and everything, what now? What is our response? It's funny to note that this existentialist conclusion that God cannot be the ultimate source of value, meaning, and morality in our reality, it scared the heck out of the existentialists. It represented a terrifying kind of freedom and responsibility for all humanity collectively and each human being individually. If you take the time to actually read the writings of the early existentialist philosophers from the 19th and 20th centuries, they all kind of have this same fear. They are scared that this existentialist conclusion is so nihilistic, so depressing, that anyone who reaches it is going to want to kill themselves, literally. Nearly every noted existentialist philosopher devotes a good portion of their writing to detailing elaborate justifications why you ought not commit suicide having read their words. <laughs> now, I can kind of understand this, this fear of the existentialists until just very recently in our Western history, in our Western culture, the default cultural understanding for generations had been, oh yes, there is a God, and of course, yes, he gives everything meaning. When the existentialists collectively realized this probably wasn't the case, it was a massive and a traumatic paradigm shift. This existentialist realization, more likely than not, led each one of these great thinkers to personally question whether or not life was even worth living anymore. Kind of reminds me of that scene in the first Toy Story. Remember that one? Where Buzz Lightyear thinks all along that he's, uh, what is it, a uh, 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 so, or if a space ranger, yeah. And then he has that one soul-crushing moment where he realizes, you know, the rug has been pulled out from underneath him. No, it's all been a lie. Now in 2015, it's clear, though, that there is no inherent biological compulsion to end one's life in the absence of an objective meaning to reality. See, the trauma of an existential crisis, like I just noted, it only occurs when the rug has been pulled out from underneath you. But see, there is no trauma if there's no rug to begin with. See, the times, they've been a change in, especially since the 19th century. We are now living fully in a postmodern age and cultural rules and expectations have transformed the way that we human beings are seeing the world. And it started especially with Generation X, that's my generation, and has continued on with the millennials. More and more children are being brought up and raised to understand from the very beginning that there is no objective meaning to things, no authoritative interpretations to stories. Entire generations are growing up now in a world and in an age where the philosophies of Nietzsche, Camus, Barthes, Derrida, and others have come to be accepted as the cultural default, the norm, not the subversion of the norm that they once represented. And understand that not every Gen Xer or millennial has read these writers or will read these writers, but that doesn't matter. See, our mother's milk was laced with these ideas. Uh, I'm personally not a believer in trickle-down economics, but I am absolutely a believer in trickle-down philosophy. So my daughter, my daughter Sage, you saw her this morning, for some reason she was a wizard. I, I don't know what that's about. Uh, but uh, my daughter, when she reaches the age of 18, if I say to her, uh, Sage, uh, you know that there's no objective meaning to life and the only meaning is that which you give it, her reply will be, duh. In spite of all the great fears of the existentialists, we do not have entire generations of suicidal moral anarchists. We don't. Instead, we have human beings with basically the same hopes and fears and struggles human beings have always had. Existentialism does not lead inexorably to nihilism. Properly understood, the existentialist conclusion is not that there is no meaning whatsoever. Rather, creation is nothing but meaning. It's pregnant with meaning 
full to bursting with all kinds of meaning, or meanings, rather. And we are blessed with the honor to shape and create that meaning, the freedom and that responsibility that ought not be a source of fear and anxiety. It should be a source of joy and a source of creative inspiration. Ours is no caravan of despair. As any bibliophile can tell you, when you have a great text to work from, reading is an exhilarating and empowering adventure. At the beginning of this sermon, I told you that I had a bit of a problem with the wording of our fourth principle. I personally don't like the idea of affirming a free and responsible search for truth and meaning because I personally don't believe ultimate meaning is something we just find, as if there really is some objective meaning to everything out there, somewhere out there, and it's just waiting for us, and maybe if we turn over enough rocks, well, we'll eventually find it. Based on all that I've shared with you this morning, I don't think meaning is found. I think meaning is created. It is created through our intentionally self-aware acts of interpreting of reading this grand book of creation. Now there's a fancy word for the study of how to read and interpret text, and that word is hermeneutics. It's derived, interestingly, from the name of the Greek god Hermes, who as some of you might know was the messenger of the gods. Ah, makes sense. A funny thing though is he was also the Greek trickster god, constantly deceiving people. So all around, a very appropriate namesake for the study of interpreting and reading text, I think. If life is text, then for those of us who wish to live an examined life, for those of us who wish to live deeply, to live religiously, then hermeneutics is super important. And so this morning, I'd like to very humbly offer seven metaphoric hermeneutic principles that I personally have found to have some utility in my own personal limited attempts to read, interpret, understand, and make meaning of this world that I am blessed to inhabit. Number one, draw all conclusions humbly and with a mind open to change. Why? Because if our entire universe is a text, none of us will ever read all of it. And it seems unwise to me to draw conclusions about a book that you have not read cover to cover. Number two, become aware of the biases that influence your interpretations. We all have biases. They're unavoidable. They will absolutely influence your perception of reality. Accept it. Number three, be aware of the biases that influence other people's interpretations because those exist too. And that could be the explanation why you might interpret things differently from someone else. Number four, engage the text authentically. Don't try to force the text to read a particular way. Take the text on its own terms and make a good faith effort to make sense of it as you find it, not as you want it to be. Five, don't be lazy. Reading is an active process, not a passive one, and you will take from it what you put into it. Life is complex. The more work you put into understanding it, the more nuance, the more beauty, the more ambiguity will unfold before you. Number six, speaking of ambiguity, get comfortable with it. A discomfort with ambiguity will push you to inauthentic or lazy interpretations. I think that being a Unitarian Universalist means striving to be comfortable with discomfort. Finally, number seven, join a book club. One with a diverse membership. There is a joy and a security in reading within a community where you can meet regularly and compare notes. Rejoice with others when you find that you agree with them Struggle with others when you find that you don't. Learn from one another. Teach one another. Support one another. 
So that's the sermon. Not very provocative, I'm afraid. Uh, you're too kind. All I'm getting at, all I'm really saying, all of this, all of this is 20 minutes that I just wasted. All of it can be said like this. All I'm really saying is life is a book, an amazingly complex, mind-twisting, heart-rending page turner. And it is our shared blessing to decide what it means. Oh, how exciting. Blessed be.